Hello, everyone. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much to your Python for hosting me. Uh, I think this is one of the uh, hardest uh, uh, conferences because you don't only have to compete with the rest of the speakers, but as well with the beach. I'm surprised to see I have that many people here. Uh, so my name is Mario Corchero. I work uh, at Bloomberg. I'm a Python developer, and I work in news automation. If you want to speak about uh, my company or Spain, because I'm Spanish, or the PyCon Spain, or anything else, I'll, I'll hang around afterwards. So today we are going to speak about logging. Uh, we'll have a brief introduction on why, why should you log, uh, how logging works, how can you use it, how do you configure it. We'll, do, we'll try to do a little uh, code demo. Uh, so I'm going to be jumping, going forth, and then some sample use cases that you can implement on top of logging. And then we'll have some time, well, we'll try to have some time for Q&A. So first of all, well, we can do a full talk on why logging matters, but in brief, uh, I see you know I see documentation as the information you give to the rest of the developers when they are coding, and I see logging as the information that you give to the developers and the C admin when your application is running. This this is one of the things that we usually don't don't care that much about, right? We put all kind of uh, logging trash, and then when we have an issue, we we really wish that we had the proper logs. So. About uh, uh, why should you use logging instead of, uh, for example, just printing blah, blah, blah around uh, all your code? Uh, first of all, well, some people actually say that if you have to use a, a debugger, that's a smell that you are not using logging properly. Uh, I don't know if you want to go that extreme, but uh, uh, using logging instead of printing, it gives you a lot of uh, benefits. It's much versatile and configurable. It's really beautiful how it splits um, the how uh, you log from the what you log. And uh, if you have a multi-threaded environment, uh, it will work compared to print, which have some issues to it. I'm trying to come with all the notes I had in my slides, so bear with me. Uh, and there are more things, I promise, but you can check the slides afterwards. <laughs> so how a login, log how a login works in Python. Python, well, is there any Java de developer in the room? You can, you can put your hands. Are, this is not the C++ conferences. We are, gonna, we are not going to hit you or anything like that. We, we respect people. This is Python environment. Okay, so if you're familiar with uh, log, Apache Log4j, uh, Python uh, was built, the Python logging model was built with that in mind, following that standard. So we're going to see uh, all different elements on, on the logging model. So the first of all is on the logging library, we have uh, loggers. Loggers are your main uh, weapon to be able to log anything. Uh, they just uh, allow you to pass a string and whatever arguments you have with a category. You know that this is going to call uh, the logger object, and some log line is going to go to uh, a string or like to the, the console or a, or a file, right? I'm going really quickly because I don't know what's next. Okay, so yeah, but it's not just like that. So the logging model is actually creating a logging record, which is an object that is going to shuffle everything in it, and that object is actually what's going to be logged. And you might be wondering, but OK, if that's an object, how is the object actually going to the console or to the file? So that's where we use handlers, OK? So we have seen logger subject, uh, uh, like logger, logger, logger records, uh, logger objects, and now we are gonna, you are seeing handler. Handler are the instances uh, that are objects that allow you to uh, print things to a file or to, um, to a console. And, uh, there, are, there are many loggers that, there are many handlers already in the built in logging model. For example, you can log to a file, you can log to console, you can log via, uh, via HTTP, you can send things to a socket, you can send them via email. And I know I'm missing one. It's in the notes. Check the slides. And so now we say we are going to create a logger object. We're going to call info on it or whatever category you want to log on. We pass all the information that's going to call the, the, the code that lives in the logger class which is going to create a log record and it's going to pass it to the handler, which is going to do its magic. It's going to emit it uh, with its code, and it's going to transform it into, uh, uh, you know, it's going, to shuff, uh, it's going to put it into a file or into the screen. And you might wonder, but how does the handler know how to put all this beautiful log record information into a file? So that's where we have formatters. Formatters are going to mix all the information in that you have in the, logger, uh, in the log record, and they are going to give you back a string. OK, so we said, we have a logger object. We call uh, info or whatever category in it with all the information. That's going to go to the logger code. The logger code is going to create the logger record. The logger record is going to pass it to the handler. 
The handler will call its formatter, which will give you back string, and then you can pass it to a file or a function, or whatever, right? So we know how longer work, how longer works. On top of all this, we have filters. We, I'm, I'm going to just spend 30, minutes, 30 seconds of them. Uh, filters are a way to be able to is a, a, a really flexible tool to be able to filter logs in some predefined conditions. By default, I mean the default logger is not that much useful, but you can create your own ones, and it allows you to attach those ones to the uh, to your loggers and to your handlers to uh, filter out some some loggers that you might not want to log. So we said we create the logger. We pass the information, it goes to the code of the logger, it checks the filter, so if all the filters return true, cool. We, uh, we emit the log record that we just created, it goes to the handler, the handler also has some filters, if that passes, then we format the log record, we get back the string and we send it out to whatever we, we decide. Great. We also have the log hierarchy, okay? So what is the log hierarchy? Don't, so we haven't seen so far how do we actually create a logger. All the loggers, are defined with that uh, factory function, which is called a get logger, and it allows you to pass a string, which is uh, a dot separated uh, naming convention. So, for example, here we can see we're creating parent dot child, and what that means is that uh, here we are defining the child logger, which is a child of the parent logger, and and so on. If we if you were to create the longer one, okay. So now we have the final one, right? So we create the logger. We know how to. Uh, now we, we log something. It goes to the logger uh, code. It goes through the filters. If it's, all, uh, if it's all good, then we go to the handler section, which is we emit the log record, goes to the handlers, blah, blah, blah. But then also, if the logger has a, an attribute called propagate, it will go to its parents and emit the, emit the log record following again this same flow. Will it execute the filter code? No. This is a great pitfall that I have fallen many times. So it will just execute this part of the parents. So when, and what the hierarchy means is that once you have, when, when you log, when you call all your handlers, you're going to call the handlers of your parents. It's not that you're going to call your parent. It's just you're going to call the handlers of your parents. Also, another way that the hierarchy impacts is that if you don't set the level on a logger, it will use the parents one. Okay, so we, we know how logger works, right? More or less, there is just two more, two more conditions. I promise this is the final one, okay? So on top of that, loggers can be enabled or disabled. And you have the category, which is also in the handler. But this is more or less the whole workflow. If you don't trust me, you can go to the documentation, which you have this, this other one, which is, is kind of the same. OK. So we know, uh, we know how logger works, right? But let's see how, how we use this, this huge uh, implementation, this huge base code. So here we can see how can we log some stuff. This is how you, as a developer, we just log things. This is the what you log, not the how you log it. That's, I think this is, I, I love this way of separating the concern of how you log things from what you log things. You are usually fine separating them, but yeah. So we just import login, uh, we get a logger, we use the name. So you can use the name of the model, which it's, it gets, so name is, uh, it will give you the full path of the, of the model that, that you're using. So for example, let's say you have project one, uh, and then a folder called um, uh, folder one, and then a file, file one. This will be project one, um, if there are Python models. Folder one, uh, sorry, project one, folder one, file one. So it gives you, by default, a really nice and beautiful hierarchy that follows your file hierarchy. We do, we log at the bug. So do we have different categories, the bug, info, error, and critical. We'll, we have a debug log that we just usually want to see maybe in our tests or maybe in our development server. We do actually some uh, execution. We catch an exception, we do a log exception. This is not a new category. This is just error, but passing X info. And X info is gonna log all the information it has, uh, like all the traceback and the, all the information it has about the, the exception. So we, do this. we can do the same with other categories by just enforce, forcing X info to be true. And if you're wondering, oh my god, I love this traceback thing. I want to see it as well in all the logs. From Python 3.2, I believe, don't quote me on that. Uh, you have this stack info uh, attribute that you can pass when you log, which will also print all the stack. Okay, cool. Now, some, some things I wish I knew when I started, things I should not do with login, is if you do this, even if it's debug, it's gonna format and it's gonna use, you know, this has a computational, computational cost formatting the string if, if you don't use it, so just pass the template and then 
pass the argument that you want to put in the placeholders. If you don't like this kind of string uh, notation, uh, the formatters have different types. I have 10 minutes or I have done 10 minutes? 10 more? Wow. So really quickly, uh, if you're doing this, this is, uh, I, I don't know how many, sorry? Okay, thank you, thank you. So if you're doing this, you probably will see errors like a terrible, uh, a terrible error ha has happened, data. I don't know how many times I've, this, I've seen this in, in programs. So quite, quite, you've, quite often uh, you are capturing an exception and logging that exception, but what is happening is, is logging the string representation of the exception, which for key errors is just the key that is missing, which is extremely frustrating. So what you probably want to do is pass X info, which we saw before, and you're gonna see the full screen. I'm gonna jump really quickly. Uh, we spoke a little bit about this. Uh, now, we know how to use it. How do we configure it? Isn't it beautiful? I'll, I'll leave you five seconds. This is how you can configure the whole login engine. It's, isn't it great? So this is the basic, uh, this is one of the ways you can configure it. You have all those uh, parameters. By default, it's gonna pin it to, uh, to console, but if you pass a file name, it's gonna, pin, uh, it's gonna point to a file. You can go over all the parameters, but basically this gives you same defaults. If you don't like the same defaults, uh, there are two other ways to configure the login model. Uh, well, there are three. You can configure it via code, like just creating all the objects manually and uh, wiring them. You can also uh, configure it via uh, a configuration file, which I don't like, so I won't show you. And the third one is you can configure it using the dict config. So dict config allows you to pass a dictionary with all the options. Uh, it can get even higher than this. I don't know if you have seen the, the login configuration on Django. That's actually what you are doing behind the hoods. You are using the, the dict config. Uh, I usually use, I, I, I personally prefer uh, dictconfig, and I'll put this config in a YAML file. I'll load the YAML file, and then I pass it to the config. Um, cool, so uh, here we can see uh, we are, we, you can define on the dictconfig formatters, handlers, uh, and loggers. Um, more in the documentation. <laughs> so uh, uh, I want to show you that all I've said is true, and I have a demo. Yes, because there are not enough technical difficulties, right? So, and I have to type with one hand. So we are going to just gonna see how, uh, how uh, a log line is gonna go through all the code we, we explained already. So we are just gonna import logging, we do basic, uh, basic config, we get the logger, and we just print it. And this is my cheat sheet. So we use Python, Python 2.4, I'm joking, Python 3, minus MPDB. Oh, you don't see that? You probably want to see it. There you are. So, uh, okay. Ba -ba -bum. Okay, so what's the first thing we see? We are gonna check if the logger is enabled for that level, right? It is, because we, we have it configured in info. And then we go to the inner function underscore log, which has all the interesting stuff. It's getting the strike info, source file, ba -ba -bam, gets the color info. And now we are creating this log record that we spoke about, right? So next, next, you can print with parentheses because it's three record. So here you can see how does a log record looks like. Okay, so it has all the information that can capture around it and also the, uh, the string and the parameters that we passed. We go next. Oh. Have I gone inside? Sorry, uh, start again. Amazing. Don't do demo with a single hand. Uh, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Next, next. No, no. Oh. Don't do demo with a single hand. I told you, Mario. So we go inside, next, 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 next. We create the logger, the log record here. Cool, and now we go into handle, which is not the handle class, but the handle method within the function. And what do we check if the logger is enabled or not? And we check all the filters, because they return true, then we are gonna call all the handlers. And I'm, gonna, I'm running out of time. This is really interesting. I recommend you do it afterwards. I'm gonna put it in the slides, but there is still more content to go over. And we have five minutes. Uh, I promise it will go through all we spoke, but there is no time. And I forgot the clicker. 
Okay. So let's see some use cases because this might be more interesting. So I'm gonna jump over this one. Uh, basically, you can define uh, multiple handlers. Something I, I have on my web is I send to my to myself all the all the critical errors via email. I have a single file with all the error logs because I may want to see in three months what actually happened with the error logs. While for the info and debug only available in 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 dev, I will just rotate them every four days, for example. So I keep only four day of logs. Uh, you can print JSON. Where do where would we do the JSON formatting in the handler? No, in the formatter, right? So this is how uh, you could uh, you could configure your application to output JSON because you know you, you are on the hype and you know that logs should not be human readable and you prefer to send it to some kind of post processing logs that will do a much better job if they take JSON. There is code. I'll try to upload it and I don't have time to do the demo. <laughs> uh, Using filters to add context, if you are over Python 3.2, there is now a factory method you can uh, configure to capture all the calls whenever a log record is created, and you can add some extra contextual information. And if you are before 3.2, some kind of convention is you can use the fil you can overuse the filters to add information. So what is this doing? This is using a nice and global scary stuff that is going to be passed to like all the logs are gonna pass through here because we saw how the filters can be added to both loggers and handlers. And uh, you can enrich it with something and then put it in your formatter. Where would you put it? In the logger or in the handler? If you want to do it for all the logs. Not everyone answering at the same time because I don't understand what you say. In the handler, we are right. Because if you do it in the logger, it will only happen for the, for the parent one, right? Because we saw that uh, with the hierarchy, you're going to call all your handlers and the handlers of your parents, but you are not going to execute the code of your parent. Okay? Uh, more cool stuff, buffering. How many times you have an, an error? You have log an error, and you wish you had only changed that uh, debug log to info, right? So this, what this uh, smart buffer handler is going to do is it's going to have a, a, a it's gonna buffering, uh, the, the, the previous log, in this case one, and whenever it detects an error, it's gonna not only log that error, but also the previous info. So you can do, for example, whenever there is an error, print the last 20 uh, debug logs. Do I have time for the demo? Okay, so then let's jump, let's jump, in case you have questions. Uh, if you want to do, if you want to, let's say that you want to get only in depth some, some you want, Sorry. You want to log the result of a function only in dev. I don't know why you would do that because you might have, for example, what's called a hasten bug, which is the, a bug that only happens when you have your logs in the bug. You can use this kind of uh, pattern, which is that you create an object that will call your function only when you call a string. And uh, that's it. Take away, stop illegal logging in Amazonas. That was the talk about. Uh, but not really. Like, uh, the logging model is. Uh, I think it's amazing. You can you can build on top of it as much as you want, and uh, it's really I, I love the way the what and the how and, and the how is, is is separated. It's, it allows all your parts of the system to collaborate on logging. So, for example, you you, you saw how we did before this thing of enriching the the, um, the context of the logger. So, something you can do if you do that is not only that your log your logs are gonna log that global scary stuff. Is that also the library that you call? Are gonna log it. So you're really you're really separating the what and the how. Um, that's all. We have two minutes for questions. That's my guinea pig. Yeah, it has some question. Uh, really, a huge applause for Mario game because oh, it was uh, in the middle of everything. So we have a question here. Uh, it seems that the login module does a lot, as you said. Yeah. What, what is the performance impact? <laughs> so, you, so actually something really scary is that if, for example, this is why I say that more or less you can split the, the what and the how. If you have uh, sending an email, this is, it depends on the handler, but quite often is, everything is hap happens synchronously. So it's really gonna impact your, your performance. If you, if you, for example, enable uh, the bug logs and you are debugging something in a for loop. It's really gonna go to the buffer and then to the file on every single iteration. So, like 
don't don't just ignore it. Be, be careful with logging. So it does have an but impact, but I haven't measured it. In normal uh, in normal performance, forget the, the debugging or something. Yeah. So it, it it depends on what you log, right? So you can see it depends on how much you log, but it it does have an impact. How many milliseconds it's gonna take? It depends on, for example, if you're doing, if you're sending an email, it's gonna take longer if you log to, if you log to a file. How long it takes to log to a file? It depends on your disk. So, so there is another question. Um, what's your opinion about uh, to use decorators for for logging? So to use like. This thing where you put uh, decorators or, uh, on a function and then will log when it gets in and when it gets out with all the... Yeah, because I heard that it's a great use case for decorators so uh, for I've logging, yeah. Yeah, I've seen that. It might be, I mean, it depends on your use case. Um, I'm worried, you know, I, I really, I, I personally prefer to write my own logs because the decorators, it feels more like I'm dumping this here, so then I'm gonna get the information when I did it. Whilst I really like to think about my about my logs. I really want to think on, you know, I, I want the logs to tell me a story, right? I want to go to my log files and see I am doing this. I want to see value because when you do the decorator, it works great for today. But in six months, when you have a problem in production and you see this function name, which is do stuff, uh, what was this thing doing, right? You can still go to the code, but if you can save the, the person, the sysadmin, the sysadmin, which might not have any idea what's going on, if you can save that step to him, that's really valuable. Thank you. Okay. Um, did you solve the uh, problem with uh, multiprocessing logging? Because it's always an issue. Yeah, you, can, you cannot do it. That's it. <laughs> I mean, you, you can, can you, would, you would have magic. to do like, uh, you cannot use the, the normal, you cannot use, something that is logging to a file. Uh, like you cannot use a, a normal handler that will log to a file from two different process because they will share the, the file descriptor, right? Yes, but for STD out now, for example. The problem is they will, sh mm, that might actually, <laughs> meh, meh. I mean, what, I have had that issue before and what I've done is I would log via TCP to another process which is actually gonna collect all the login. Sorry. Excuse me. Yeah, so uh, a lot of developers put just everything into log info, right? Uh, so just dump different variables and parameters. So one of the approaches to solve this problem is to use struct logs. Uh, I don't know if you know the struct Sorry, log. Can you say that again? Struct logs, so st structure okay, logging. Yeah. yeah. So how is your, your view on solving this problem so that Developer just put everything in there. Do, uh, do, do you use structure logging or how yeah, so, so this fragment where I'm logging JSON, it actually comes from there. Uh, I was shuffling it and then you can process it afterward and choose what you want to see, how do you want to see it. Thing is, I usually, I'm still maybe old school using log files. Not that I like it, but that my environment is what we have. And at home. At work, for example, we use things like Splunks, Splunk, and more convenient thing. So if you have the infrastructure to do like structured logging where you can log JSON and then parse it and accumulate it and whatever you want, go for it. If you are gonna do an app at home that you're gonna log files or even your company doesn't have that and you're still griping through log files, you really don't want to read JSON, right? But I think I think it's it's cool. Like I think if you you know what we do today as well is we log into a file and then we we parse it. If you can if you can save that, it makes total sense. Yeah. Um, to your comment on um, yeah, to your okay. comment on uh, don't don't have a a call that just says do stuff. So one best practice I heard was uh, always have at least enough hierarchical naming that you can see what object. Sorry, I, 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 I don't. T to your comment that don't just have a logging message that says do stuff, a best practice I heard is preserve at least enough levels of hierarchical naming on the object that you can unambiguously see what called and when. And I had a question for you. Um, what is the guarantee? You can, format, you can format millisecond resolution on timing, but what is your actual guarantee about the order and the accuracy 
uh, platform level accuracy of the timing and logging messages, especially if it has to ripple up through multiple parents. So, did, 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 you, did you ask the millisecond if, if, timings? If, did you ask if it guarantees that things will go to the file in the same order that you log? Was that the question? In, in supposedly, it's, it's guaranteed that in a single threaded process, you stuff is in order. But the, the millisecond timings may still be inaccurate. So what's your level of expectation about the actual accuracy of the millisecond timings? Should you, you know, what can you trust? Is it good to the nearest 10 millisecond or 100? Or Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Did you ask, the, 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 maybe the mic? I'll catch you off. Okay. Yeah, in, if you don't mind, uh, you can uh, talk with him later. Okay. And thank you so much for everyone. And uh, another applause for Mario.